Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's. It feels like it's an extra special webinar because um, we're on a Tuesday lunchtime as opposed to a Wednesday morning. So welcome um, everybody to those of us who regularly join us for the South East Perinatal Mental Health webinar and hopefully lots of new guests as well. Um, so today we've got our hour and a half slot that we will be focusing on uh, the perinatal mental health long term plan commitments and particularly thinking about expanding the cohort of women. So just a couple of housekeeping um, kind of reminders. So please could people keep their lines on mute um, and for most of the morning, we'll ask people to switch their cameras off while speakers are doing their presentations. Um, but Verity, um, who will be giving a presentation about her lived experience, has invited people to keep their cameras on for that part of the session. So please do feel free to do that. Um, please obviously use the chat function. Please share your comments. Um, it's always good to see who's on the webinar. So feel free to put your name and what organisation you're representing today. Um, also uh, raise hands if you have questions and then um, there will be an interactive part of the session today so um, we'll give further information about that later and then also just to remind everybody that we are recording the webinar for those who weren't able to join us live today so um, that will be available both on the NHS um, Futures Collaboration platform as well as the Southeast Clinical Network website um, probably at the end of this week, beginning of next week, we will also send out slides and um, a link to the, the recording after the webinar as well. OK, can I have the next slide, please? So, and can we go on to the agenda, please? Thank you. Lovely. So we have got a really packed agenda today. Uh, we've got some fantastic speakers, as always. Um, we're going to start off uh, the session with uh, Verity giving her lived experience insights, um, which will be, I think, is a really good way for us to start sessions like this. Um, then Lucy is going to set the context from a national perspective. We're then going to go into a bit of an interactive session, which Heather will lead. So thinking about how we really understand the expanded um, perinatal mental health cohort um, and how we need to um, expand in order to meet the long term plan access ambition. Um, so that will be a really great session for us all to get involved in and then have some a case study from the Hertfordshire Community Perinatal Mental Health Team. And then thinking about key system learning for the implementation of the expanded uh, perinatal mental health specialist community teams, both from uh, a service manager point of view from Carly, but also a commissioner perspective um, from the Northamptonshire team. So um, a great uh, session ahead of us. And I will hand you over to Jenny, who's just going to do a quick introduction. Hi everyone. Um, so I've got the lovely job today of of um, introducing the speakers. So that, that's delightful. Um, and as Liz said, it's always so important to have um, the insight from people that have lived experience. So it gives me very great pleasure to introduce Verity Westgate, who is a member of the NHSE National Perinatal Mental Health Co-Production team. So over to you, um, Verity. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here today. Um, can I just check? I think Rosie or Helen is going to move the slides without me having to say next slide. Is that OK? Is that the plan? Amy's running yeah. slides and I believe no that is the plan. Excellent. Great. So I'll just concentrate on speaking. Um, Brilliant. So I'm Verity and I'm on the NHS England co-production group for perinatal mental health. Um, and thank you so much for having me here today to talk about your to talk about my lived experience um, in relation to the long term plan for perinatal mental health services and particularly around the ambition to extend care to 24 months postpartum. 
So for me, I think there's three key reasons, four key reasons why I'd like to see this ambition implemented, and I'm going to say a little bit more about these um, as I go on. The first is that perinatal mental illnesses can be complex and need to be given sufficient time to resolve. Secondly, return to work often happens around 12 months. Thirdly, the value of nursery nurse input through the first 1,001 days. And finally, discharge should not be like falling off the edge of a cliff. Um, and I'll say more about this um, as I talk about my story. But firstly, this is Grace. Um, got a picture of Grace. The slides aren't moving forwards for me. I don't know if they're moving forwards for other people. They're not. They might suddenly jump in a moment. Uh, we need the picture of Grace before I can carry on talking. Shall we wait for the slides or shall I keep going? You wanted to keep going, Rarity, if that's Kim. We'll just try and get the slides back up and running. OK, it's just a bit of a shame not to have the, have the I've slides I've clicked there. the slide ahead myself. I don't know if other people can do that or if we're supposed to be able to. But it's I let can me. as well. I, I just observed that I'm able to move forward myself in the presentation. So I've got the picture on slide seven. Oh yeah, okay, well please do navigate through and I'll tell you when to um, navigate forwards. I think maybe that's the best thing for us to do um, if the slides aren't working live. Okay, so this is Grace um, and she is now three um, and she's clever, kind and funny and she's meeting or exceeding all of her milestones. And I don't think that would be the case without the amazing and life-saving care that I received from my local perinatal team. So it took me a long time to decide to have a baby. Um, it was something that I really wanted, but with a history of poor mental health since my teens and a family history of postnatal depression, it felt like it was a risk that was too big to take. However, by 2018, I'd been well for over three years and I was approach as I was approaching my mid thirties, it felt like it was kind of now or never. Um, but unfortunately, my misgivings were correct and I had very bad perinatal mental illness. By the time I was eight weeks pregnant, I was unwell with antenatal depression. And by 20 weeks, I had the massive breakdown, which saw me referred to the perinatal team. Whilst I was doing a bit better after giving birth, in part in thanks to the care that I was getting, by the time that Grace was five months old, I was becoming seriously unwell with postnatal depression. And by the time that she was six months, I had an emergency admission to a mother and baby unit. I came home after five weeks because it was felt like I could be better looked after by the community team. I got a little bit better. I got worse again. And then three months okay. later, I found myself on an acute ward. Two weeks after that, the first COVID lockdown happened shortly before Grace turned one. And it's been a very long journey to piece myself back together. However, although at times this has been a very bleak and desperate period of my life, it could have been a lot worse. And that was thanks to the care that I received, which was directly tailored to what I needed. But during pregnancy, I had regular appointments with a community psychiatric nurse, and then this continued with a social worker after I gave birth. Um, but what was amazing was that the service were able to send one of the team with me to go to my appointments with the obstetric consultants at the hospital because I found it too stressful to go on my own, and my husband wasn't able to take the time to come with me. And over three or four very long waits, I got to know the nursery nurse really well. And this laid the foundations for a good relationship where she would support me when my daughter was born with literally everything have, relating to having a small baby. I also saw a psychologist and a psychiatrist, and I was also diagnosed with autism in the postnatal period. And after this, I had some appointments with an autism specialist nurse. So if we go on to the next slide, which says um, about what was helpful. So what was helpful, um, particularly for me with the care that I had? Um, so firstly, being with me where I was, and this was exemplified by the first time I met the psychiatrist the day before my first hospital admission, so I was incredibly unwell. I was sitting on the floor with Grace when she arrived, and whilst my care coordinator sat in her usual place, she came down and sat on the floor with us and carried out the whole appointment from there. And I think that's personalised care at the core, providing care to the individual where they are and using that as a starting point rather than trying to impose a certain model or mode of treatment. Then being able to build relationships, as I've described with the nursery nurse, with key members of staff over a long period of time and being able to build up that kind of trusting relationship. Next, the staff pulling some strings to get me an autism assessment. Um, it's not normally possible to get one in my area if you're under psychiatric services, um, but we felt that it was really important that um, we got an answer on that question. Um, so they worked very hard to arrange that for me. 
and then making care adaptions to my care to meet my needs as a person with autism. Um, so having regular appointments at a certain time of the week, giving me space to process things that were being discussed, and particularly from a psychiatry point of view, recognising that like many people with autism, I have overly sensitive responses to medications, which can mean that usually usual doses tend to lead to intolerable side effects where micro doses can actually um, be effective. I understand that there might be some problems with the slides at the moment, so I think I'm just going to have to keep talking. Um, so um, also being given intensive nursery nurse support um, was helpful to me. Um, so after we discovered that I was autistic, we realised how important this was to enabling me to parent successfully and to understand how to interact with my daughter. Um, good communication between the staff who are working with me um, and the wider team. And this meant that the different staff communicated with themselves between visits and so that weekly team meetings meant that the whole team had some familiarity with your case. So that if you rang up to speak to someone and you're one of your regular workers was not around, then the person you spoke to would rarely be starting from scratch. Um, good resourcing was also important. It's really interesting comparing the experiences I had under the perinatal team to subsequent experiences as I've had um, with the adult mental health team and the crisis team um, where resourcing has been really poor and there's little communication between staff or with you as a patient and it feels like care is something they're doing to you if indeed you feel like you're getting any care at all and that makes me sad because my experience under the perinatal team um, makes me see that it could be so different. And perhaps most saliently to this talk today, my care extended past Grace's first birthday. So she turned one four weeks into the first coronavirus lockdown, and clearly that wasn't a good time to discharge anyone. I was then diagnosed with autism and some follow up work was offered, which could only be carried out if I was under a mental health team. So a plan was made to keep me on while I completed this. And then a stage discharge was planned, leading to a discharge when Grace was 19 months old. So this benefited me for the four reasons that I men mentioned above. Perinatal mental illnesses can be complex and need to be given sufficient time to resolve. Return to work often happens around 12 months. Value of nursery nurse inputs throughout the first 1,001 days and discharge should not be like falling off the edge of a cliff. So I'm going to share some quotes um, now from some of my colleagues at the NHS co-production group to illustrate my points, as well as highlight how each point um, reflects my own experiences. So I was hoping these will be on the slides, but um, as they're not, um, I'll, I'll read them out. So here, one of our group talks about the pressure that she was under um, at the 12 month point. And she said, I was given an ultimatum, leave the mother and baby unit to go home, feeling not at all not at all ready to manage without inpatient support or be transferred to an adult only psychiatric unit without my baby. I chose to go home, um, but having had a few more weeks would have eased the pressure enormously. So for me, my autism added complexities to my perinatal mental illness in terms of getting my medication right. We are still trying to find the optimum combination of medication well after a year, and we needed strategies to help me manage autism plus a small child and a history of mental illness. And I've been in hospital after a major episode of illness twice in the six months before Grace's first birthday. Perinatal mental illness doesn't often have a quick recovery. Um, when I was in the mother and baby unit, I met a couple of mums who were there with their second child and I asked about their experiences with their first. Um, both of them said that it wasn't until their um, child was about 18 months to two years old um, that they felt that they were feeling and coping better, um, which felt really like a horrendously long time when I had a six month old. Um, in my case, I think it was about 15 months that I finally um, started enjoying spending some time with Grace and honestly not until she was about three um, that I felt that I had a really good relationship with her. So secondly, many women um, return to work around the time of their child's second birthday, first birthday. Um, and as another one of my um, colleagues says, the end of maternity leave coinciding with the end of mental health care was very anxiety inducing. Having specific support around these anxieties would have been beneficial. Um, so this is a major period of transition that benefits from support. So a child might need to be settled into childcare. There can be increased separation anxiety around this age. And it's a big change to suddenly be away from your child um, so much, causing a lot of anxiety for many women. So for me, the return to work happens at nine months, um, so it was a bit earlier than here, but it was incredibly destabilising and it was a factor in my admission as around um, 11 months. So in my um, next quote, um, the mum says, specialist support in the second year of my child's life would have made such a difference to our relationship and my mental health. 
think there's huge value for women to continue to have the input of nursery nurses in the second year of life um, because they're just really well positioned to help with this. So the 1001 Days campaign reminds us that the most crucial time in a child's development is from conception until age two. Um, I asked some nursery nurses what additional support they could give with um, an extra year and they had lots of ideas. Support around settling the child into nursery and managing to manage, manage balance home life around work, maybe support around breastfeeding when returning to work, um, giving support with any concerns about development as they often start to arise in this time period and continuing to help with support for eating, sleeping and ideas for play. As I said earlier, I benefited so much from the support I had from my nursery nurse. And although much of this, our extra time was spent negotiating a pandemic with a one year old, she really did continue to support me with Grace's development and knowing what to expect and just supporting us with the development of our relationship. So finally, it's really important to give women a chance to transition out of the um, service. Um, so this member of our co-production group said, I felt rushed to be discharged. I mentioned my intense anxiety over returning to work and my child going into nursery. I was told all mothers feel this way. And I was made to feel that others needed the service more than me. So perinatal mental health support can be quite intensive. So to go from this to nothing could be quite challenging. So some of the extra time up until the age two could be used to make sure that women have a good ending and are able to transition into any follow up care or support, whether that is from a community mental health team, the third sector or something else. Um, and with the extra time that I had, I was able to get ready for my discharge um, and handovers were arranged to um, some autism support from the private sector, the nursery nurse from the health visitor team and a referral to the charity home start. So overall, the extra time um, when it's extended to up to two years will really enable women to be in a better place with their mental health and with their relationship with their child. And finally, just to take you back to Grace, um, the reason that getting perinatal mental health care right, which may include making it available for longer, is because the better the outcomes for the mother, the better the outcomes for the child. Thank you very much. Thank you, Verity. And what a compelling argument for um, our services to continue um, for the women who need it up until um, 24 months. Um, we do have a question. I'm just deferring to the national team to know if we have time to answer questions in person or whether we're going to ask for questions in the chat. So does somebody from the national team mind answering that one and then? We can either take the question or direct it to the chat. I think for now, probably questions in the chat, Rosie. Does that make sense? Because we've got quite a packed program. Yeah, OK, so I saw that was Leanne. So if you don't mind popping your question in the chat, Leanne, that would be great. And, and um, the most appropriate person will will answer it. Um, so. Yes, yeah, so thank you again, Verity. Um, and that's sort of set a really good context as well. Moving on on the agenda, we're now going to go to um, Lucy Ellis, who is our, I'm going to read your title out properly so I don't get it wrong, the Perinatal Mental Health Programme Lead for NHS England. And Lucy's going to give us the context for our long term plan commit commitments. So, um, I'm going to hand over to Lucy now, who will um, just remind us of those um, commitments within the long term plan and what they actually mean in practice. Over to Lucy. Lovely. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. So I think it's really clear listening to Verity and Verity, thank you so much for sharing your experience um, and for coping with the IT challenges. Um, you know, listening to Verity, the human case for these services is really, really clear, but we just wanted to re-emphasise that there is also a very strong economic case for perinatal mental health services. So you might be familiar with the 2014 London School of Economics report that led to the establishment of community perinatal teams um, under the five-year forward view. The graphics on this slide are from that report. So untreated perinatal mental health leads to major costs um, to the health service, public sector, wider society. And nearly three quarters of that cost relates to the future impact on children. So investing in perinatal mental health services is about prevention 
for future ill health and leads to future savings in CYP mental health services, adult mental health services, A&E, physical health. Um, and I think the thing that's important to remind ourselves of just now is that that 2014 LSE report, it didn't just make the case for small five year forward view teams, it made the case for the expansion of services that the long term plan has committed us to, to the need to extend services in the community to reach all women with moderate to severe or complex needs and not just uh, women with severe mental illness. Next slide. And so just reminding us COVID, you know, that strong case existed and then COVID happened and we know that the pressures that's added onto new parents is, is immense and ongoing. Next slide. So this is just a reminder of what the long term plan commits us to. So to increase access nationally to see 66,000 women and to expand services so that they're available to 24 months after birth, to increase access to psychological therapies, including more parent infant work, couple and family work, to attend to partners of women accessing services by offering them an assessment of their own mental health and signposting them to support, and by establishing maternal mental health services for women experiencing mental health needs arising from trauma or loss in the maternity context. So that's what we're aiming to do. And this is just sort of to locate all of us and remind us of the starting point. So in green on the left, the five year forward view established small perinatal services everywhere in the country. And the work of the long term plan, the programme of change that we're going through at the moment is about really expanding those services. Um, and that's an immense, you know, that would have been an immense challenge before COVID and obviously COVID made it very difficult to change. So we're right in the middle of trying to think about how to expand the service, the type of work, the type of women that teams work with, all of that. Next slide. So just to take a moment to think about how new maternal mental health services fit with the perinatal community teams, which are themselves expanding. So maternal mental health services, MMHS, are were envisaged to respond principally to women suffering from PTSD following birth trauma or perinatal loss. But in some areas, perinatal mental health teams may be attending to those women. And so just to make the point that the boundaries between maternal mental health services and perinatal community teams is going to vary across the country. Um, but the important thing is that a specialist service should be available for the whole cohort of women and that in each area, MMHS and perinatal community teams need to work closely together to clarify pathways, referral criteria, and ways of working that makes sense in the local landscape, because obviously every local context and what other services are available will be slightly different. Next slide. So another point which has come up recently and just seemed important to emphasise up front. So the access ambition, um, it was informed by the 2016 ONS birth rate um, and at 2020, the most recent data, the birth rate has declined, although actually 2021 data looks like it's heading up again. Um, and so just to be really clear that this, you know, it was always expected that birth rates would fluctuate and vary over time as with all public targets of this sort. Um, but we've done a lot of reflecting and there is real national commitment to maintaining that um, ambition to see 66,000 women, in part because the prevalence data suggests that actually moderate to severe and complex need may be higher than the rates that the long term plan was modelled on. And also all the difficulties that we know about in understanding true demand because of the barriers to women accessing services and coming forward to ask for help in the perinatal period. And in particular, um, that research shows that women from ethnic minority backgrounds face higher barriers. Um, plus COVID, which has increased pressures. Next slide. So yeah, just to be really clear that you know, the funding was made available to see this number of women um, and that that is still very much the ambition and where we need to aim to get to. The other thing, just to clarify, 
that cohort used to be talked about as as being 10 percent because 66,000 is 10 percent of the 2016 birth rate but just to hold in mind that the um it's a multi-year cohort so perinatal period spans two years and nine months and many women will need to stay on caseload for more than one year and each woman counts towards the access ambition in each financial year that she's on caseload and is seen face to face or on video so again just to kind of hold in mind that actually this ambition doesn't mean seeing one in ten of every woman who gives birth it's 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 a you know because you're working across multiple years um so just to help in those local discussions that we know come up about whether there are enough women out there as far as we understand the evidence there are women who who really need these services um so that's the policy context and the economic context and if heather has managed to join the call i'm going to hand on to heather uh, or maybe back to Jenny, I guess, to introduce Heather. Yes, I know you're perfectly capable of introducing Heather, Lucy, but it's, it's my job today, so I should I should carry on. So now we have Heather Oman, who is the National Clinical Advisor for Perinatal Mental Health for NHS England. And Heather, I do believe we're having a bit of an interactive session, so I shall leave you to um, very capably tell us what we're going to do. OK, thanks, Jenny. Um, and thank you, Lucy. Um, so we do have a bit of an interactive session. I'll talk a bit at you first before we get to the interactive component, though, so we can segue um, into that. Um, if we move to the next slide. So building just a little bit on what Lucy was saying and thinking about some of these expanded bits and kind of on the ground functionally, what does that mean? And I guess it's just really driving home the point that as we are looking for this cohort of women that we're working with, going from the five year forward plan and that severe cohort and then the expansion into more moderate and complex women from the long term plan that it was really, it, expanding then to meet an additional group of women who were in that moderate and complex cohort that we knew that we weren't reaching and we were actually hearing from services that they didn't have the staffing and the resources to work with all of the women that were out there. So we're talking about people that were around um, personality disorder, quote unquote, or complex needs associated with complex um, emotional needs, um, OCD, PTSD, and other problems, and also extending 24 months um, after birth, which Verity, I think, has argued um, and for com very compellingly and has given a good example of why we need to do that. Of course, also the MMHS programs as well. And I think it's also a thinking about and understanding complexity and where that fits into the picture and thinking about perinatal complexity um, and the way that having an infant um, has a complex impact on women and families and, and how that maybe makes mental health and helping and with mental health problems look a little bit diff different than it would outside the perinatal period. Um, but also then with this expanded cohort, it really meant that some of the ways that um, services were working with women would be fundamentally different. So we see this increase in psychological professions coming on board, differences in staffing, and we're saying psychological professions in a broad way, and we'll come back to that, but an increase therefore in psychological interventions, in parent-infant work, and in couple and family work as well. Next slide. Okay, thanks. So teams now have this, this different way of um, this different staff kind of combination as you will all have experienced. Um, and so there's a wider skills that's happening, um, expanded patient cohorts and new ways of working. So it's, I guess, important to say that whereas in the old model, all women were perhaps getting care coordination or some variant of care coordination, it may not now be the case that that is what is needed to be done with every woman that comes through. So it's just thinking about how does that work in the system and in the team? Um, and how do you manage that and who's working with who? Um, next slide. Okay. But critically, as all of this is expanding and working, and as I think teams have very much been finding their way around working with this cohort and these new ways of working, it's also keeping in mind that it's critical 
to reach this cohort of folks to maintain close ties with maternity and with primary care. It's critical that we have those links clearly all the way across the care pathway and that the whole care pathway understands what this transformation is really about and who to refer to. Um, and so we know that this, that this is important. We, in our minds, we all do this, but we also know from the numbers. We know in areas um, where there's a lot of kind of joint working and really good working across the care pathway that we see that increase um, in cohort that's coming across. Um, it's tough work, we know, it's time consuming. Um, and we also all have to be aware of the fact that there's going to be things like staff turn. So it's a constant kind of job where we're working to keep the rest of the care pathway informed um, and working closely with us in a collaborative way. Next slide. Great. And also going back to what Lucy was earlier mentioning, we know we've got a group of women that we're still not reaching as well as we could be. We've got a lot of underserved groups, ethnic, minoritized groups, um, that we're not seeing them in the same rates that we likely should be seeing them. And so while all these changes are going, and in the context of COVID, and you're all doing a brilliant job managing all of this. Um, but it's also thinking about creative and different ways of working to reach those kinds of groups, working closely with community groups, working closely with religious leaders, um, having um, a broad range maybe of peer support workers who look like and are from the communities in which we want to reach out to. Um, also young mothers and mothers from lower incomes and difficult complex backgrounds and just really thinking about where are those communities and what ways do we need to reach out to them um, very assertively and compassionately as well. Next slide. Okay, so on the back of that note, now we get to the interactive component, which we hope will be a little bit of fun for everybody and lift this kind of webinar a bit. So what we're gonna do is um, present you with a couple of clinical scenarios and you have the opportunity to go to Mintimeter. We encourage everybody to do so. It's really exciting to get to see these kind of results. So if you just go to minty.com, you can do it on your computer or on your phone if you don't want to use your computer while you're watching this webinar. And if you enter the code that is here, or you can scan the QR code right now if you would like. Um, it will bring up the Minty question. So I'll give everyone just a moment to do that. Give 10 seconds. Okay, so hopefully folks have got that. If we go to the next slide. Oh. Okay, excellent, thank you. Okay, um, so here we've got our first case. Um, and so you will see on the next slide, there is a question about this. So this case, um, what we want you to uh, ponder is whether you think this person is appropriate for the perinatal team or not. If you have any thoughts or comments about why you think she is appropriate or not, please do post them in the chat because it's really interesting to get that conversation going as well. Um, so this is a woman who has, um, uh, she's 25, she has moderate depression and social anxiety. She has been referred from health visiting over concerns of possible neglect to the infant due to, to worries that the mother may have um, also difficulties kind of reading her infant, kind of understanding her infant needs. So there's concerns from the health visitor that the mother says, oh, everything is fine, it's great, and I'm super bonded. But observationally, they're kind of worried that maybe there's some difficulties reading infant cues. Um, so she may be inadvertently uh, neglecting the infant. Um, so a little bit of worry that she's kind of on her own with this, so living on her own. There's not any contact with dad. Um, she's a little bit isolated, so maybe there aren't people in her environment who are going to give her some of those cues as well. Um, although she does have a good relationship, and this is a plus and resilience factor with her mother and stepfather. Um, she also, um, she has a mild learning disability, um, as mentioned. Um, and what's good is that she reports strongly a desire to be a good mother. Um, and, and she does feel at least 
from herself that she's um, very strongly bonded with the infants. So that's a good starting place. So the question then, should we accept her into the perinatal team or not? Um, and if we maybe give people's responses and we can see them from Minty. Oh, this looks really good. Perinatal team doing a great job with these slides. Let's see, we've got over 200 people on this webinar, so I'm sure there will be many, many responses. Just fantastic. Okay. Okay, it looks like what folks are saying, kind of across most folks, majority is saying yes, a few folks saying no. Um, and, and we've got a significant minority uh, saying maybe. Um, more folks saying yes, <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm just gonna go to the comments. If anybody else wants to write any comments in here. Um, da, 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 da. Yes, because of complexity. There's not a one size. Um, oh, whoops. Giles, I see that you are responding to a different thing, so I will not read that out. Any specific comments anybody wants to say about this? Okay. I think we, from, from the team's approach, we thought, yeah, this would be an appropriate referral for the specialist community team. Um, maybe if the learning disability wasn't there, maybe if the parent infant difficulties weren't there, um, she might be seen in another service. Um, but because there are these additional complexities, she would fit the criteria for complexity um, and therefore be potentially appropriate uh, for the perinatal team. So we would agree with uh, 111. Um, if the other folks who slightly maybe had a different decision want to post some conversational points later, that's fine. But um, yes, we would agree with the most what most of you have been saying as well. Um, so. Next slide, we can do the next case. This one is really also to warm us up. So let's see what we think about this next case. Um, so you should on Menti as well, you should see the screen um, updating. Um, so you have a new question there. So this case is um, a woman who presents with OCD. So this is a 27 year old woman. Um, she's got OCD, agoraphobia, and social anxiety. Um, she's reporting intrusive thoughts about her children, and she has harms, or I'm sorry, intrusive thoughts about harm towards the children as well. Um, these thoughts are difficult enough for her that she is, um, because intrusive thoughts are quite actually common during the perinatal period, um, but they're they're distressing and difficult enough for her that she is really avoiding um, things that have to do or bring up these thoughts. She's avoiding sometimes caring for her children um, because of the thoughts. So that's um, troubling. She presents as well with history of childhood sexual and physical abuse as a complicating factor. She contextually, she um, struggles with low income and lack of educational attainment. She's left school without completing her GCSEs. So that's contextually quite a difficult position then for this family to be in. Um, on the plus side, she is in a supportive relationship with a partner, but he is also struggling um, from mental health issues. So folks, what do we think? Is this woman appropriate for the perinatal team or no? Let's see what folks have said. Heather, there's a comment in the chat from Beth um, about the age of the children, but I think we're assuming there's a baby under two, are we? Yes, yeah. So there's a there's a number of children, but there's at least one child that's under two. So that's why the referral has been made over to the perinatal team. Good question. Okay. Looks like we've got really strong response, some more responses coming in, but really a strong response here that this woman belongs in perinatal. I feel like maybe we have a hangover effect from the first um, from scenario on one, potentially, but um, any particular points why folks think that she is especially appropriate for perinatal? 
Ah, thanks, Kathy. You might consider a joint assessment with IAMPT to ascertain complexity of psychological needs and risk further before deciding on the appropriate pathway. Yep. Um, absolutely. And if you go to the next slide, um, I think that's a really nice point that you make, Kathy. Um, in fact, we know that there are some really excellent clinicians doing really good work in high intensity IAPT around um, OCD. And so it might be appropriate to just think about um, the best ways of um, joining services and helping the woman um, and just thinking about the most appropriate pathway. Also, just thinking about what is going on with the child needs and any other complexities that are going on. Um, with this woman. And it may be that the perinatal team might take this woman and if appropriate, and if the resources are available and I have, perhaps the IAP practitioner might do a specific um, piece of work um, with the woman. Um, yep, a bunch of folks saying um, maybe they'd be suitable for IAP. And, and that's, that's absolutely the case. Um, there are many um, circumstances under which perhaps IAP might be able to help or take this woman. But I think in this case as well, a lot of you said, oh, we'll take her in perinatal. It's also thinking about the impact on the her relationship with the kiddos and, and the infant and thinking about some of those kind of social complexities. Not that I have dozens of people with social complexities, but it's also just thinking about that perinatal team um, and that dyadic relationship and really helping to make sure that the parent and the infant are both getting set up on the best um, pathway. Um, lots of really Really good comments. Thank you. Yeah, lots of people. This is really lovely to see lots of people talking about joint assessments with IAPT, remembering dad and co-parents. Absolutely, Jenny. That's a really fantastic point. Thank you. Um, and and dad is struggling. And so this is a great opportunity in, in the long term plan to also think about dad's needs and getting that assessment in there and thinking about is there any kind of um, couples work that can be done here? Is there also onward um, referrals and assessment and support that um, dad can access um, and that the perinatal team can help with? Um, yep, yep. Jessica, just thinking as well about her insight with OCD in the context of the difficulties um, in caring for her children. Absolutely. Um, involvement of local early help prevention, early intervention workers would be very beneficial. This is really fantastic. And I think it's a lot of themes here around activating kind of all of the resources that are out there that can surround um, this woman and help and support this woman in the way maybe also the perinatal team can help to ensure that this woman has the appropriate supports both in this acute phase, but then also upon discharge kind of long term, what's going to continue to really set up this family to be on the right path. So I think it's really fantastic. Um, so yes, we would we would agree um, with a lot of folks here and with all of these comments that we think she would in the circumstance be appropriate for perinatal, but obviously with careful thinking about that um, and managing that with other parts of the care pathway um, and just thinking about the parent infant work, any support work that she might need um, and any specific therapeutic and medication that um, she might need or want. So really great points. Everyone, thank you. Uh, next slide. Oh, wow, we have reached the end of the presentation. That's very exciting. I think I'll hand back to Jim. And I think just before we do hand back, is it worth emphasizing, perhaps we already said this, that we have more um, case studies like these two up on the Futures platform that people can refer to. So if you're having local conversations and want to work through more um, specific case examples like this, they are available. OK, brilliant. Um, that's a really interesting exercise. And, and there was some really interesting comments as well in the chat. And I think what struck me was I could see how many different sort of services people are uh, sort of hooking up with and 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 getting involved with and 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 enhancing their own pathways by finding out everything else that's out there. Um, and I think flexibility is the the key word here. That you know we are services that are accommodating and will go and have a look if 
you know, we think it might be appropriate, even if that assessment means that we're then finding somebody that's even more appropriate for them. So, um, so we've heard from Verity with with the with the lived experience um, story. We've heard from Lucy giving us the policy context, and we've heard from Heather with some examples of 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 what that might look like. Now we're going to go on to some real life examples of, of how teams have been meeting the challenge. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to Lindsay from the Hertfordshire community team. Lindsay's the interim service manager um, and she's going to talk us through a case study of theirs. So thank you, Lindsay. Hi everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Lindsay. I'm the interim service manager at the Hertfordshire community perinatal team. Um, so yeah, I was asked um, to speak, give a bit of an overview of the expansion really under the under the long term plan. So um, I'm really going to be focusing on the expansion of the therapies, so the psychological therapies and the parent infant um therapy in the team also a little bit about how we've increased our referrals and then also the kind of partnership work we do across the perinatal pathway and specifically with um eastern north hearts um, and west hearts antenatal services i think i've just talked my way through the second slide if you can um <laughs> yeah i'm um, just so i haven't um i haven't timed this presentation so please feel free to um tell me to to shut up if it goes too long um, so this just gives a bit of an overview of our team, really. Um, so we've got the operational team management, um, the perinatal psychiatry team, and then the next two kind of streams are the ones that I'll be talking kind of most about. Um, so we've got the perinatal psychology intervention, so that's individual and the group programmes. Um, and then we've got the parent infant pathway, which also includes um, nursery nurse team and um, the systemic family um interventions as well which is actually just kind of getting up and running in our team um also i'll be touching later on the occupational therapy and recovery interventions again that are our, our run as a sort of individual and a group program so the the initial assessment and the care coordination team at the bottom um the this this make up our, our band six kind of care coordination team um and we split these two functions just under a year ago um, and this came about after feedback from that that staff group, really, who were struggling with all the different sort of aspects of their role. So managing duty, doing telephone assessments, doing face to face initial assessments, doing care coordination, kind of pe people feeling like they were doing a bit of everything. Um, and actually, through the feedback from them, we ended up splitting those those roles. So we now have a mini initial assessment team and a mini care coordination team. Um, kind of historically, Hertfordshire, we've always kind of split ourselves into kind of four quadrants, north, east, south, east, north, west, south, west. And so we have an assessor and a care coordinator in each of those quadrants. Um, with another couple of people joining us quite soon and generally there's been some really good feedback from the clinicians on having kind of more focused roles so that's worked quite well for us um yeah and then kind of spanning across that is our duty system like most teams i'm sure and then the admin team who um they predominantly support the the, the psychiatrists but also kind of across the rest of the team um okay so next slide OK, so this just shows a little bit about how we've grown the sort of therapeutic offer in the team. So this was kind of up until the end of the LTP year two. Um, so these this, these kind of pathways kind of grew significantly, really, between year one and, and two of the LTP. And you can see kind of on there, I won't necessarily read them all out, but you can see the kind of whole time equivalents of the, the parent infant therapists. Um, the clinical and assistant psychologists, and then also the OT and recovery team as well. Um, so we also offer the kind of um, the VIG, the video interactive guidance, EMDR and um, CFT, the compassion focused therapy. We have quite a lot of other people in the team that aren't um, psychologists or parent infant therapists that have been trained up to offer those interventions as well. So they kind of span span that kind of um, all of those pathways, really. Um, the peer support worker who's right over there on the right hand side at the bottom, and um, she 
is literally it's brand new in our team and she's just going to be joining us um, in a few weeks time so that's that's pretty exciting for us so that yeah that just gives you a bit of an overview of kind of how many of of, of everybody there is in the team really okay next slide So this is um, this is a little bit about our group programme. So some of these groups may kind of sound quite familiar to people and others a bit less so, which I'll talk about in the in the next slide or two. So some of them are kind of ones that are kind of locally or, um, you know, our team have developed, whereas some of the others you'll some some people will recognise things like the emotional coping skills group. Um, circle of security, compassion focused therapy, baby massage. And this just gives a bit of a sense really of where they fit into the, the complexity really. So we've got the antenatal low complexity, the adjustment to motherhood group, which I will give a little bit more info on. Um, that's something that we developed in the team um, a little while ago. And then the antenatal high complexity. So that's the mentalization um, in, uh, introduction group that's that's going to be run jointly with the psychology and the parent infant team um, and the emotional coping skills group run by the psychology to team and then we've got the postnatal low complexity so the balance after baby group is a is an OT um, group that we that we run which I'll talk a little bit about later as well and then we've got baby massage compassion focused therapy and then the high the more of the high complexity group so the emotional coping skills group could could fit into there as well um, the parent infant circle of security group and another kind of locally developed group the do live well group which we've um, we've developed quite recently and then kind of spanning all of that really is the peer support group that we're looking to um to set up when our um when our when our peer support worker joins us very soon um okay yeah next slide so this just gives a little bit more of a sense of those of those kind of locally uh, CPT developed groups that that we've done really. Um, so the adjustment to motherhood group is a is is one that really it's the it's a four four week antenatal group, um, and there's input from all of the um, or a lot of the MDT for that group really. So it's predominantly around sort of improving relationship with baby, um, and also particularly sort of for those women that maybe like they are unplanned pregnancies or we think they're going to struggle um they may struggle a little bit more than some people kind of postnatally um so that's a that that's a, that's a four-week group we have input from the psychology team the nursery nurses parent infant team and occupational therapists as well um and the next two groups are predominantly um sort of developed and run by the occupational therapy um, and recovery team um, so the, the balance after baby is it's there's a big emphasis on kind of peer support through sort of the group and um, group discussion as well. But then there's a different session. I think it says on there a different session each week. So we're looking at things like routines and sleep, mindfulness, that kind of thing. Um, and then the Do Live Well group is is a is a new group that's just starting um, through the, the the recovery framework really. Um, so we're people kind of have to be able to get out and about for that because it's um, kind of community activities for, for both mum kind of and baby and child as well um, and again really about kind of connecting with other people for, for some of that peer support as well. Um, okay next slide. Okay and this just gives a bit of an overview of the the parent infant work that we do so again sort of on the left hand side the sort of less complex um, cases up into the the kind of more moderate to severe parent infant difficulties and, and higher complex so some of this is, is around the group um, some of the groups that I just mentioned and then also um, so that you know the less complex um, we'll be looking at sort of individual nursery nurse support and possibly because our nursery nurses are trained in video interactive guidance as well so we could be doing that um, and then kind of moving across um, it may be sort of more um, intensive work with one of the parent infant therapists and, um, and also maybe the circle of security or baby massage groups um, and then moving on to the the, the mentalization group that I mentioned before um, and then individual work with the parent infant ther therapist which can kind of include any of those so it could be kind of um, some of the others on there are like watch wait wonder circle of security and the, the video interactive groups. OK, next slide. 
and that just that's just a little bit about um kind of the individual psychology um therapies that we offer um so again sort of along with along with the parent infant work this has been the main kind of increase um that we've been offering really um through psychology and and parent infant so yeah these are just uh, i won't necessarily kind of read them all out um but obviously some of them are sort of trans diagnostic and others are, are, are focused on certain um certain diagnoses OK, next slide. And yeah, so I wasn't necessarily asked to talk about um, OT um, intervention, really. It was more the sort of psychology parent infant work. But we thought it was really important to kind of add it in um, because actually I think the OT work has, has really helped with the expansion of the service, um, especially, you know, expanding the numbers through the, the, group in, the group intervention. So they've done some fantastic work in developing new groups. And it's meant that maybe some of the women that wouldn't have met sort of threshold before um, we've been able to increase referrals by um, them, them being assessed and then um, coming coming to one of the groups, really. Um, so I think, I mean, you can see on there, there's kind of a particular focus with OT, you know, quite obviously on sort of the change of roles for, for mums and expecting mums, um, you know, adapting to motherhood and kind of balancing that new life, really, um, along with kind of managing sort of self-care and, and other kind of co-occupations, really. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just really, really important to mention that the, you know, the importance of... Um, of the OT work that's been done in the team and how that's managed to kind of get us to where we are when, with increasing the referrals, really. Um, OK, next slide. And we can go straight on to the next one, actually. <laughs> um, OK, so I think, I mean, I can't remember who it was. We were touching on this before about the kind of percentages and the numbers. So um, at the top was the kind of our baseline of the, the 5%. Um, and then kind of um, that was the up until the 2019, 2020. And then obviously the three years of the LTP. So kind of going towards that 10%, 2022 to 23. And then the numbers that under there are just the additional percentages of the women we need to see. And then the how that works out is in, into the total number of women that, that we're going to be seeing. So this just, sorry about those horrible little text, that little text boxes, they shouldn't be there. Um, so, yeah, this just explains a little bit more, I guess, about how, you know, how we've managed to do that. So for us, it's been offering sort of parent infant and other perinatal kind of specific interventions with other adult mental health teams. Um, so some of those can go directly to the therapy or the, the doctor streams. They don't need I think someone was saying earlier, you know, they don't necessarily, you know, all need um you know care coordination or you know other interventions they can go they can go straight to maybe for to outpatient appointment for a perinatal kind of um psychiatric opinion or they could come straight to one of the straight straight to see one of the therapists um and then also you know for us as well it's about identifying those the kind of missing patients so really promoting the preconception counseling work and also making sure we all kind of get out there and do some some outreach teams um, outreach works to some other teams as well um, and also i think as well hertfordshire's you know it's a very kind of white area and so really we, to be honest this is something that we need to to really start to focus on engagement of the the BAME communities that that we feel like we're missing out on quite a lot, really. Um, so that's something that we're certainly looking at at the moment and how we can kind of engage some of these groups that um, historically we we probably haven't been able to quite as well. Um, and, and I think as I've touched on, it's, again, for us, it's about kind of lowering some of these thresholds. So maybe offering brief interventions to kind of people with a lower level need. So um, the adjustment to motherhood group that I mentioned and things like the compass compassion focused therapy groups as well. Um, and then, as we've been talking about extending, extending up to the two years, obviously, and at, at the moment, um, we're certainly starting to do that, being very flexible about kind of referrals um, that come in with, with the aim of, of, of getting to that two year very soon. Um, OK, next slide. 
So this this is um, just the, the next couple of slides are just a couple of um, slides that our data quality officer put together for us. And just really, so obviously this one is the referrals to the team rather than the amount of, of women that we've seen. Um, and this just kind of indicates the the, um, the the gradual increase over so the first one I think 2018 to 2019 um, and then where we are um, 2021 to 22 so you can just see the gradual um, increase in referrals um, and the next slide if you go on to the next one um, this the, this is taken um, from the the national perinatal mental health dashboard um, so this is the kind of the, the actual access figures so these are the women um, that we've seen had at least one face-to-face -face contact with within a within that financial year so um, yeah not not we were very pleased to see recently not kind of far off our our target already which is really great um okay the next slide so this is really kind of where we're heading so um we're thinking about assessment and signposting so for us sometimes we're you know a, a really important bit of work can be a one-off assessment with with someone and that can be you know that can be a, a really important piece of intervention in itself and signposting um the initial assessment team are absolutely imperative for for doing that um, and then also some of these women would go straight um, to see a doctor as well. Um, so they're the assessment and signpost, that's kind of like a, you know, a one sort of two, two kind of um, contacts really. Um, and then moving on to sort of the brief intervention. So probably the, the lower threshold care, um, possibly again with the IA team, the, the aim has always been really for them is to do an assessment and then but potentially offer a kind of an extended assessment, maybe two, three sessions um, and then think about whether they, they would need to remain under the team after that. Um, and also um, looking at accessing the, the mild to moderate kind of target group programme that I've mentioned. And then sort of going further down to the full perinatal care. So women who are kind of exclusively under our care and have access to the full kind of package. So whether that's kind of care coordination, um, any parent infant, OT, psychology interventions and seeing the, the doctors in, in clinic as well, the psychiatrists. Um, and then we have the other kind of aspect is the perinatal specific work that we're doing. So this is predominantly kind of joint working with other mental health teams. So historically, we haven't really, if women are open to other mental health teams, we don't generally take over their care, but we always offer kind of joint working to them. Um, so sort of perinatal specific interventions that, that aren't really available in their, in their own team. So that can be the parent infant, um, you know, perinatal psychiatry, and then um, psychology and OT interventions. And we'd also, innate, um, you know, obviously have, they could have access to the, the group programme as well. Um, OK, next slide. So, um, yeah, upcoming development. So this is um, kind of pretty much at, at the moment that the family therapists and the peer support workers are all about to st start kind of any day, really. Um, so that's 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 really great for the team. Um, and then, you know, when peer support work, workers uh, workers up and running, um, then we will um, be developing a peer support group as well. Some of the groups I spoke about earlier are starting in the autumn. So the mentalization introduction group and the do live well, the the um, community group and also um, that the brief intervention pathway that I just mentioned. So the maybe the sort of two, three contacts um, developing that. Um, obviously, also looking to support for partners. We're um, at the moment developing the partners assessments and then also hoping to start partnerships with other agencies. So maybe um, kind of family centres to, to support partners as well. Um, and the other, other ideas that are being considered a, a kind of crisis, crisis nursery nurse role. So sometimes we have a little bit of a wait in time um, for people to see our nursery nurses. So we're looking at um, thinking about a crisis nursery nurse role um, and also kind of other groups and workshops as well. OK, next slide. And probably the next one as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is so this the next few slides are mainly around um, the joint working that we do with Eastern North Hearts and the West Hearts perinatal 
um, midwifery services really. So, um, I mean, strengths at the moment, we have regular um, multidisciplinary team meetings with them, um, kind of respectively, not sort of all together. Um, we do weekly referral screening meetings with, with, um, with both of them separately. Um, which is really useful. So we're triaging sort of information sharing forms that come through um, and then deciding whether they would um, kind of meet the criteria for criteria for the, the CPT or not. We offer joint clinics in both of those hospitals as well. So one of our psychiatrists with an obstetrician um, and often also input from one of the perinatal uh, midwives as well. Um, uh, Pre-birth care planning and then just lots of kind of liaison and, and information sharing, which is just, yeah, which is kind of invaluable, really. Next slide. Um, so this really is just um, the kind of process that we have with East and North Hearts. Um, so there's a little bit of data there around the amount of births and then the amount of information sharing forms that are, are generated. So the information sharing are around women with um, mental health needs um, or a mental health history um, and also safeguarding issues as well. So um, the perinatal midwives rag rate them and then we they triage them with someone from from our team as well. So this generally means that you know people are are triaged um, very quickly because they the the ISFs are generally done at booking appointments, um, and then they're usually triaged within a week or two of booking as well. Um, and then that information is obviously then shared with the the relevant community midwife, health visitor, GP, um, just so that every you know there's really good communication. Um, and really, it just means as well that if there's any safeguarding concerns, um, the maternity safeguarding team are are involved as well, and the care plan is 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 shared with them. Okay, next slide. And really, this is a little bit about kind of what's ongoing, I guess, and what we want to continue in, and what we want to continue doing. Um, so again, just keep strengthening the sort of communication. Um, so really, any discharges of women that are open to our team, we'd always want to kind of know about those. Um, we're still developing or kind of continuing to develop the, the, the good links between community midwives and the care coordinators in the perinatal teams. Um, and really, we want to be kind of updating them with any um, outcomes of initial assessments that we're doing as well. Um, we mentioned the um, MMHS earlier, a couple of people have mentioned that we're, we're very much in the kind of planning stages for that sort of adverts have gone out. Um, so yeah, we're, we're still planning that at the moment. Um, there's a, the, the perinatal midwives um, at Lister in Eastern North Hearts have, have started a perinatal midwifery mental health clinic. Um, so really the aim of that is to develop personalised care plans for women with additional kind of mental health needs, just to ensure that they don't have to retell their story all of the time. Um, so and it, it's also kind of another level of support for women who may not reach the threshold for for the perinatal team. Um, I think they've, they've only started it fairly recently, um, but they've um, yeah, they've had really good um, some really good feedback regarding that. OK, next slide. And this is just really the, the next steps really for, for partnership working. So I think what we've been talking about is that it would be really good to have much closer collaboration with the, the family sector, uh, family centres and the third sector, really. So some of the team, you know, they forge their own relationships in, in the areas that they're working with, in with certain, some of the family centres. Um, but I think for the team as a whole, it would be, you know, it'd be great if we could have a kind of closer collaboration with them. Um, the work with partners, I've kind of mentioned that a couple of times, we're very much developing that at the moment. And also just looking at, you know, we've we've got lots of groups kind of up and running at the moment, but really thinking about we've had interest from sort of obstetricians and other people in the area that would be interested in kind of co-delivering groups and workshops with other people. Um, uh, yeah, with others in our in our team, um, and then also yeah, just developing the the peer support um, role in the team, but also within the kind of community as well. So we've had quite a few women in our team who have expressed 
interested in setting up peer support groups in Hertfordshire. So it's just really thinking about whether we can, we as a team can kind of support them with that, because that's something that women often ask us for, you know, to, to speak to other people who have been in similar situations. Um, so we'd really like to be able to kind of partner partner up with them as well and 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 kind of promote that for them. Um, I think that's it. Thank you very much. So I ended very abruptly then. <laughs> no, it, that was amazing, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Um, and there's been a lot of wonderful networking happening in the chat while you've been talking. So it was clearly a catalyst to a lot of other conversations. Um, so thank you. And any questions for Lindsay, just to keep us on track time wise, let's let's put those in the chat as well. Um, OK, so moving on to our last speakers. So we now have Carly Gilpin and Morgan Price. Carly is a service manager for Specialist Perinatal Community Team and the MNHS. And Morgan is program manager for the Integrated Care Pathway. And they're going to talk to us about key system learning from the implementation of expanded perinatal community teams. So really, um, another live example pulling together a lot of the stuff that we've heard already so i'm going to hand over to you two thank you very much thanks ever so much um i'm hoping morgan's here are you here morgan yep i'm here oh, hi, hi everyone <laughs> thanks ever so much um i really enjoyed the presentation we've just had i think it's always reassuring to hear what others are doing and finding out that you're on very similar tracks so thank you that was that was really reassuring okay so um yep so i'm carly galp and i'm service manager of both the perinatal and maternal mental health service um we're going to talk with you we've only actually got a couple of slides so i wanted to make it as informal as possible um and some of the stuff it, it, it probably just flowed very naturally um, and certainly isn't rocket science at all. Um, could we have the next slide, please? OK, Morgan, was there anything that you wanted to say at the beginning before I start? Um, I might as well just introduce myself as well. So I'm I'm Morgan Price. I'm the programme manager of the Mental Health Learning Disabilities and Autism ICS programme I, and I was the adult and older adult mental health commissioner. I've been seconded into our NHS trust to commission alongside providers in an in an integrated way, if that helps. Thank you. So I think it was at the sort of early point of the long term plan um, and mid five year forward view that Morgan and I first met together um, and went through the objectives, um, the fixed and flexible ambitions and actually made um, a plan for the whole of the long term plan. So we looked uh, at developing a, a multi year uh, plan uh, that looked at our increasing access, but also to look at um, what our local area was like, how many um, women that we would see and um, look at where we would prioritise the long term plan ambitions. So uh, we knew our access was going to increase year on year. That was non-negotiable, but actually we wanted to do year on year investments. So when we were successful in our wave two uh, bid, we only had initially one psycho psychologist, um, Dr Kirsty Harris, and she made huge inroads into developing our psychological service. But we recognised quite early on that we needed quite significant psych psychology and psychological therapy investment. So that was actually our first um, first investment year's priority. And we had probably some quite significant challenges with uh, psychology recruitment that I know everyone around the country does. So we had to think quite creatively and as well as re successfully recruiting um, two clinical psychologists, we then looked at psychological therapists and senior psychological therapists. And that has really helped um, with depth and breadth of the interventions we can deliver um, and supervision to other staff. Um, so that was our first first year um, and our second year we looked at um, kind of increasing our uh, perinatal practitioner numbers, our nursery nurse numbers and also our medic intervention. Um, I think from the start it's fair to say that we have um, 
we've decided that actually the files and partners ambition was the one that we really weren't quite so sure about. So we left that for the long, the last year. That wasn't that we um, didn't value it or, or didn't think it was important, but actually we wanted to do some of the groundwork um, first to look at actually what, what was this going to look like as an ambition and also um, who did we need to link with in order to make this successful. So this is the one that we're starting this year um, and we're starting some stakeholder or started some stakeholder engagement. Um, and I'll talk about that again um, shortly. Um, so throughout we've brought together both obviously um, our commissioners, but the, also we talk about perinatal mental health, at our wider mental health collaborative meetings, and then also at the long-term, uh, at the maternity, and neonatal um, meetings as well. I think that's been really important that um, so that we've been able to ensure that everyone really understands the objectives of the long term plan um, and how we're expanding, what we're offering um, and, you know, in line with the long term plan expansion tool. Um, one of the things we've been really keen to do is ensure that lived experience um, is integrated into our development. So we have our own lived experience network. But the one thing we held back on that I think probably other services were initially um, a little bit more forward was the development of peer support roles. So we'd had some um, some women with lived experience share their stories with us as we developed the services going as far back as, as wave two. And what we'd actually noticed was that because we hadn't got the structures in place to do uh, to help women tell their stories kind of in a safe and um, planned manner, actually two different ladies had, had shared with us and they'd really struggled with their mental health afterwards. They'd really gone up there, they'd they'd shared what had happened to them and and they really struggled. So actually we thought, you know what, for the peer support, we need to get everything in place so that the peer support, prospective peer support workers can undertake their training. That means that they'll they'll discuss um, and learn about kind of keeping well, say their own um, well-being and telling their story in a safe manner. Um, and actually, I think on reflection, I'm really glad that we did do it this way because actually we had we were successful in gaining uh, peer support training places from Health Education England, and we've managed to support uh, women that have used the service and, and others that haven't used the service to go through the kind of accredited peer support training first and then come on board in substantive roles. Uh, so I think we've managed to still get that lived experience, but um, do it in that in that safer way. So that uh, and we now have three substantive peer support workers and are looking at increasing this further. And I would say that they feel like to me that the, almost the the last piece of the jigsaw. So um, we've had all of our other multidisciplinary colleagues and, and someone had talked about nursery nurses and I would say we have four um, and they are absolutely integral to the team, um, community perinatal nursery nurses. Um, but our peer support workers were that missing link and now we have both individual and group peer support work going, going on. So um, that's been great. I think it's been necessary to fly the flag for perinatal mental health at pretty much everywhere we go that it does interface so many areas I'm not sure I'm not sure there's another area like it that um you know both on the children's transformation work streams there's elements of perinatal mental health that are really important the maternity and neonatal system the adult mental health system um we're currently working really closely with our um our colleagues uh, that are focusing on the family hub agenda. So it really does tip into so many different areas. Social care, it's taken us uh, with our children's trust quite a long time to make those relationships and look at education and training um, with, with social workers and, um, and foster carers that might provide mother and baby placements. So it's really important that as well as your kind of leadership team, there are people representing perinatal um, and really also that parity of esteem during the maternity experience with mental health and physical health. Um, and having a continuous communication strategy at all levels. So we've linked in not only with our internal trust communications teams, but across um, the wider um, what was CCGs um, and our comms teams at our acute trust as well, just to get the messages out there. We've had um, a maternal mental health week 
and a perinatal loss week last year. And again, sharing those messages across um, all of our different organisations. Um, so we're talking today very much about expanding the service. Um, we continue to ensure that we're kind of growing that perinatal frame of mind. So building relationships with maternity, health visiting, IAPT um, and our wider primary care. We did have to stop some of our training for a while during COVID, but that's all we started. And we've actually expanded that uh, to include, as I said, our children's trust. So um, social work and um, fostering um, teams as well. Uh, we're not only doing the education and training, it's been really important, particularly with IAPT, to offer supervision and development and consultation. So our psychology colleagues will offer this on a monthly basis as well as the training. That's the step two and step three. And this has been really helpful because actually we've been able to have more meaningful conversations about uh, where cases can sit. So we're trying to avoid this sort of ping pong of of women having to be assessed by multiple teams. So if we do an assessment and we think that they are suitable for IAPT, we actually link in with them and say, look, we've got this case. What you know, what do you think? And they'll talk about whether they can can meet that need um, without having to kind of have more more reassessments. Um, so we've got the uh, ongoing education and awareness work with the whole pathway. But also, I think what's really important is around feedback and reflection, particularly when there's cases that can be complex, tricky. Um, and, you know, sort of after the event, using those cases to think about actually what might have been done differently, uh, not in a, a criticising way or as though something's gone wrong. But actually, if we have these sorts of cases, how can we make sure we're um, providing women with the right care at the right time by the right place. Um, we, we're always thinking about quality as well as not not just the number um, and increasing trajectory. And Morgan, you know, on a monthly basis, you bring the figures, don't you, to our um, collaborative meeting, um, and we have we have shown that increase year on year. Um, and are performing well, but I think it's important that we think about the interventions that that women are having, and it's not just a case of getting as many women through the door as possible. Um, our deliverables, I think it's we've we've learned that we we need to be realistic in terms of our our therapy offers. So we've almost got a bit of a dichotomy where we've we've got an amazing staffing team that can see the potential to support women and families at every opportunity. So every woman that's referred, there's something that we could offer. And I think sometimes it's it's difficult to have those hard conversations about some of the cases like we've we've seen today. Um, yes, we could offer, but where's the best place that can can support this this family? Um, and it might be actually that that IAPT might be appropriate or it might be that um, particularly women with some of those longer term uh, lifespan needs. It might be that we can do some work. Um, it might be stabilisation. It might be an OCD intervention. But actually, there's some there's some of those longer presenting needs that haven't been that might require another service. So we've got a complex trauma service um, that's been recently set up in our county, um, and we quite often with the maternal mental health cases have conversations about actually what can we do now as a service for that for that woman and um, what might be more of the longer term need. Um, we have, have budgeted up with other services, um, sharing learning and initiatives. We're, uh, we're kind of buddy trust with Leicester Partnership Trust, so hoping to do some of that now. Um, and also across our health visiting and maternity, um, I'm pleased to say that we've got some of the shared kind of learning events planned for September, which is really positive. Um, Utilising existing services in the wider community, so um, within our adult mental health services, um, I think, I don't know if it, you've got anything to say, Morgan, but I think, you know, there's a lot that goes on in terms of the third sector, and this is something that we want to try and mirror. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a um... I guess in some ways, I think the 
the way the rest of our systems are developing at the moment has has kind of fitted in really well with the evolution of our perinatal mental health service so it's quite in one ways it's quite fortuitous that we put the the assessment and signposting of perinatal partners later on in our own development plan because it has allowed us to transform a lot of the other mental health services around our system which has involved a, a, a huge amount of subcontracting and 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 what and what what we're calling collaborative contracting with our VCSE sector, our primary care colleagues, and that is probably going to be a lot of the services that these um, fathers and partners need. But in other ways, it's 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 been a little bit um, it's been a little bit frustrating because there is there has been pieces of work which have been launched through the core twenty plus five and addressing inequalities. And Paul Carley and her team have have been launching pilots to kind of look at what inequalities are around our system and now suddenly there's a lot of infrastructure within systems and a lot of investment going into exploring those inequalities so in some ways it's been frustrating and in some ways it's been fortuitous um but we're sort of we'll get there by the end won't we carly <laughs> yeah definitely and, and with you know i mentioned about the fathers and partners so obviously we're very clear of what's expected of us as a service from um the FAQs and the actual flexible ambition. But we've decided actually, while there's this opportunity to have a focus on the mental health needs of fathers and partners, if we're going to see 10% of fathers and partners potentially, if we if we look at the kind of it might be 10%, um, but they're 10% of the 10% access that we're seeing, potentially that's a huge amount of fathers and partners in our county that will still struggle with their mental health in the either whilst they're part whilst the the birthing woman uh, birthing person has had the baby or actually uh aside of that so what we're doing is pulling all of our stakeholders together to try and pull together a pathway of what's available for fathers and partners when they're struggling is there any um kind of innovative work we can do and that links in really clearly with some of the trailblazer work that's going on with the with the um, family hub and the best start for life offer and actually that will help us twofold. So it will help with our internal service offer, but also more widely um, families in the county. And that just seemed the sensiblest thing to do. Uh, so we're, we're really excited to start that as well now. Um, and I think, uh, you know, our um, third sector organisations will really play an important part in that. Um, workforce, um, we've put quite a few things down here. We've been really keen to ensure that we, we've got extended roles and career opportunities. You know, the long term plan talked about um, making perinatal a career choice and that there were was a time when I think we were quite limited when we were a smaller service in that um, there wasn't really anywhere for, for practitioners to go. But now we've got some really clearly defined pathways, particularly um, with our nursery nurses that we've that you know, one of our nurse nurses is training now at supervisor level in video interaction guidance. So people are um, their knowledge bases and their ability to supervise and train other staff um, needs that reflection. So this is something that we're looking on now. Um, again, the opportunity to be be flexible and and look at other development opportunities. We're really fortunate. There's lots of opportunity for training in psychological therapies um, and another another other areas. I think we've learned that having that protected time for team building um, and staff getting to know each other again. So we've recruited a whole cohort of staff that have never been never actually um, met each other face to face. And I think giving that that dedicated time is really very important um, and implementing the kind of evidence based guidance and, and best practice around different interventions for, for different women at different stages. Can I have the next slide, please? Can you just give a one minute yeah. warning? Thank you. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So there's there's still lots to learn um, and lots of next steps. So again, that that building our relationships um, probably wider than the, the current um, current offer and definitely finding out what's happening in the local area around parent infant relationship services outside of perinatal. Um, Morgan had touched on a, around um, the equality and diversity agenda and, and he's right. We have spent a couple of years trying to focus and um, it seems everyone is knocking on the doors of the same 
same people. Um, so it's really important to have a coordinated approach and consider digital solutions. Um, and I think our final kind of learning point, and I don't think it's something we've actually got there yet, is around navigating that mild to moderate, severe and complex. And I think, again, it's about making sure that we've got um, good relationships with different services, developing those links and link workers and champions. Um, and last thing again, staff wellbeing, so sustainability, thinking about the development of staff, um, where staff are on their own perinatal journey, um, ghosts and angels in the nursery. So it's it's not about just providing for 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 our you know access rate. It's also about looking after the staff that are in our services. Fab, that's all from me. I don't know if there's anything else you want to say, Morgan. Um, well, I could I could probably go on a lot about the development of the ICS in the context of perinatal, but I think considering time, if anybody had any questions, I could perhaps answer them via email or or in the chat. Thank you so much, Carly and Morgan. That's so helpful. And Lindsay, your presentation beforehand, I think in both of those cases, you know, where we've seen that your areas have invested in perinatal and then we can see what can be achieved. Um, so I think we're on time, so I better make this quick, but um, just to say thank you very much for everyone taking the time to join us. Um, we know that already a huge amount has been achieved across the country on perinatal, and when you think back to before 2015, it's really amazing, the progress that has been made. And we know that people are working really hard in really difficult circumstances. Um, so I think, Carly, your point about supporting staff, is essential, isn't it? Without that, nothing. And we know we've still got work to do to, to realise the vision that's set out in the long term plan. And I realise if you're listening in an area where the perinatal service hasn't received full investment, um, we know that's really hard. And so there's something about thinking through who do you need to speak to locally? Who are the decision makers? Who are the senior people who need to understand why perinatal is so important? Why investing in this service, um, you know, prevents people showing up in other services. I think there is something about that ongoing awareness work and just retelling the basic story of why this stuff matters. Um, so if we can support you with that, we really want to, please use the Futures platform, please email us, tell us what we can do. Um, but yeah, I think I'll hand back to Liz just to say thanks very much. Definitely, thank you very much, Lucy. A massive thank you to the national team for doing this webinar collaboratively with us today. A massive thank you to all our speakers and most of all to all of you that have attended and probably given up your lunch time to attend. Um, we had 290 people on today, um, which considering it's peak summer holiday season was fantastic. Just to let you know, there will be dropping into the chat an evaluation link. Please do fill it out. It's really important that we have feedback about these sessions. Just a reminder as well, to those of you that normally join the Southeast monthly webinar, this webinar has replaced our webinar that was due to take place on the 24th of August. You will have received a cancellation for the 24th of August and our next monthly webinar will take place on the 21st of September. So we hope to see lots of you there. Um, so I hope you all have a good rest of the day and thank you again for your contributions and networking in the chats. Bye bye.